Good afternoon. Welcome to That Times of Refreshing May Come, our four o'clock Wednesday Bible study. Our topic today is Pentecost, the festival of Pentecost that we just celebrated on this past Sunday. And uh, we would love it if you were, if you join the study, if you're able to, just to say hello on the chat and uh, we'll say hi back. Hello, Jenna. Nice to see you today. Uh, we'd love to uh, be able to greet one another. And as I go through this study, as I can, I will try to acknowledge the things that you write and we can have a discussion together. Hi, Tiffany. Good to see you today, too. Uh, it is a beautiful day outside here today. And uh, it's wonderful to see the sunshine uh, as we remember the, the warmth of the Holy Spirit in our lives as well. And our theme today uh, that this study has been based on that I chose way at the beginning of the time of pandemic was Acts 319 repent then and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing may come from the Lord and I truly believe that that's the the longing of the heart of the Lord is to bring his refreshing into our times into our hearts into our lives uh, that comes only by his power hello to David and Audrey good to see you today um, and so when I picked this verse as the theme verse of our Bible study on Wednesdays, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I had no idea how appropriate it was going to end up being. It seems like every week there are different aspects of what this means in our lives of discipleship uh, to Jesus. And in our confession that we do every week, we confess what we've done and what we've left undone. Uh, the things that are seen and unseen of our own sins to us. And much of what hasn't been fixed in our society and our world and how we love our neighbor, how we love one another, I think really comes from those, thing, those sins that we have not seen, how we've left un, undone, the things we've left undone and the things that are unseen. Um, so the truth is we need the Holy Spirit to help us to see one another with the eyes of Jesus. Uh, that we need more and more the power of the Holy Spirit to be at work in our hearts, to help us to see what we don't naturally see in situations that are unlike our own, to be able to help us to love our neighbor well in a way that actually feels like love to them. Uh, the way that, that we ourselves wish that we would be cared for and loved by other people. Um, and so this theme verse from Acts 3.19, Repent then and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Reminds us of that pattern, that we turn our attention first to God. Um, so we repent, we notice those things in our own lives and our own hearts uh, that we need to turn away from. We turn to God and he brings his times of refreshing when he wipes our sins away through the redeeming work of Jesus for us. We are given a new start by the power of his Holy Spirit at work in us. And so as we prepare for our study today, as we're looking at the Pentecost, uh, we're actually going to start, we're going to spend most of our time in Acts chapter 2, um, but we're going to actually start at the end of the Gospel of Luke, in Luke 24, and the beginning of Acts, Acts 1, which sets up some of those questions uh, for the disciples, set this, sets the disciples up for what they will receive in Acts chapter 2 of the the coming of the holy spirit so if you want to prepare your bible for that uh, we're going to start in luke 24 but before we start we'll start with a prayer all together so please pray with me lord jesus we thank you for gathering us together we thank you that you come and you meet us right where we are uh, and that you invite us to wait to receive and to be moved by your holy spirit so, Lord, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would move in us, that you would move us uh, in the teaching of your word and the receiving of your word, that you would continue to teach us those things that you promise, Lord, that um, your Holy Spirit will uh, teach us all of the things and remind us all of the things that you have commanded us, remind us who you are. And so, Lord, help us to have hearts that are open to learn and to receive from you. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hello to Catherine and to Scott. Glad to see you here today as well in our study. For our study today, as we are taking a look at the Pentecost today, 
We're going to actually start in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, uh, starting with verse 36, as we hear from the risen Jesus as he comes to the disciples and he prepares them for what he will do in the sending of the Holy Spirit. So uh, if you have your Bible, please turn to Luke 24, starting with verse 36. I'm going to read through verse 49. While they were still talking about this, that was the, the people who encountered Jesus on the road to Emmaus, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. The ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So Jesus begins in verse 36 with giving his peace. <laughs> when you see someone that you know has died and they are standing there in front of you, you can understand why you need peace. <laughs> uh, that the disciples receive this word of peace in the presence of Jesus there with them. Um, so he begins with blessing them with peace. And then we see in verse 49, uh, the things that I was talking about in uh, my sermon I gave at Community of Grace on Sunday, uh, that they were to wait, they were to stay in Jerusalem until they had been clothed with power from on high, uh, Jesus told them. You have need to wait and receive. And then implied is, in, in the until you have received, uh, is implied is then you will move then I will give you the next step. I will send you forward. So thinking about this, it's curious to me when I think about this, uh, is the timeline. If you take a look at uh, Acts 1, 3 through 8, we're going to take a look at 3 through 8 and verse 9 in a minute too, uh, we'll notice this timeline that uh, Luke in writing the book of Acts kind of starts back and recaps a little bit of this experience of Jesus being with his disciples after he is resurrected. Um, and what we know is that Pentecost comes 50 days after the Passover. We know that Jesus died and was resurrected at this time of the Passover, uh, three days from death to resurrection. And then he appeared to them for a span of 40 days. And then he ascended to heaven at the end of those 40 days. Um, and waiting for the 50th to come tells us, if we look at our math, and that about basically the disciples had a week in between the ascending of Jesus and the descending of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so they had a week of waiting, of figuring out what is in between. And uh, the question I want to ask you to ponder as we are look, taking a look at this beginning uh, verses of Acts is why this time, why this week of time that they are given? Why did the disciples need it? And why do we? Hello to Sue. Good to see you, Sue. Why do we need time to prepare when everything changes? Um, thinking about the big changes that have happened in our world, in our lives, when you are faced with something that's completely new, something unexpected. What do you need to wrestle with, grieve the change, come to terms with before you are actually ready to embrace what's new, what God will bring next? So that's just a question that I wanted to ask you to ponder uh, as I read these verses from Acts chapter 1, uh, starting with verse 3, and then I'll go actually through verse 9 
Um, and this is kind of a recap of what we already talked about in Luke 24, starting with verse 3. After his suffering, he, Jesus, presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Hello to Arena. Good to see you today. So in this time frame, as I was uh, just sharing, uh, there were 50 days before the Pentecost, 40 days that Jesus was there uh, showing them proof that he was alive with them, instructing them. But at the end of these 40 days, when he ascended to heaven, he told them to wait, to wait to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then they would be witnesses uh, to all the all the world starting in Jerusalem and then to the ends of the earth. Uh, so they were to wait to receive and then be moved. Hello to JB. Good to see you, JB. So thinking about this, um, this time in between, this roughly a, a week that the disciples had after the ascension of Jesus and before the coming of the Holy Spirit, uh, they had this week to prepare and to pray and to wait to receive what the Lord wanted. Um, now, I just wanted to ask you, what do you think was happening in the disciples' hearts at that moment, uh, at that, that waiting time? Thinking about in your own life as you have been um, absorbing the changes of your current world, waiting to see what God will do next, what are the things that you need to wrestle with in your heart when the Lord is telling you, uh, that something new is coming? Um, what are the things that you need to to let go or to grieve? Uh, does waiting time actually help you in the midst of that? Um, and how long does it take for you to really engage in prayer, to let go of expectations in order to really hear what, um, what the Lord is telling you? Um, the reason I ask that question is I know for myself, I am not a person who loves change. <laughs> I am not high on the change spectrum. Uh, usually for me, it takes a while for me to really get my heart and my mind wrapped around um, letting go of one thing and starting something new. Um, and so uh, I know for myself when the Lord kind of gives me a heads up that he's going to do something new in my life or in the world, uh, I resist it at first. It takes me a little bit to really come to a point where I can surrender and say, okay, Lord, your will be done. Uh, what do I need to let go of in order to embrace something new, uh, in order to do what you are calling me to do now? Um, and I, I just feel as I've been reading these texts, I really resonate with that of where the disciples were, because this is a pretty major change uh, to be able to see Jesus ascend to heaven and to no longer physically have his presence with them, but to know that they're going to be sent out on mission, on Jesus' mission, and with his presence in a radically new way. Um, it takes some time to absorb that and to really prepare the heart for what that new season is going to look like. Hello to Judy. Thanks to have, glad to have you here with us. Uh, and thanks so much that you joined us today. So looking at this week, uh, between Jesus' ascension and the, the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, we can take a look at the book of Acts and we see what the disciples were up to. They were waiting, they were praying, they were waiting to receive. They were also kind of taking care of business. As If you take a look in those verses in between, uh, where I stopped reading in the beginning of Acts 2, they were trying to figure out uh, what to do with the open spot uh, of the apostles 
uh, without Judas. And they ended up replacing Judas with Matthias, uh, another disciple who had been with them and had been learning from Jesus, who had been part of the Jesus movement all along. Um, so they were kind of thinking forward momentum of uh, how do we move forward. Um, and whether or not that was a super important thing for them to do at that moment, we really don't know. Or if that just came, kind of came from their place of humanness where they felt like they should. Um, either way, uh, Matthias is in the mix now and they're able to move forward um, as apostles. In, in way, some ways, I think that kind of signals an understanding of the disciples that things were going to be different. They weren't exactly the same. Uh, maybe it was a way of them preparing their hearts that things were going to be different and new. So then we get to Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to start with just those verses first. So the disciples have been waiting to receive, knowing that once they receive, then they're going to be moved in a new direction. So Acts chapter 2, right. 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I just saw a comment here from Scott, facing major change, anxiety, resistance to change, wanting to maintain comfort. In the army, they always give warning orders before the actual order is given. This is to allow you to get ready. This was Jesus' warning orders. That is absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, get ready, something's coming. Prepare your heart, prepare your body, prepare your spirit uh, for what this next step will be. And here uh, in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we see that what God does in the sending of the Holy Spirit is to show them something very obvious. Nothing can be missed. Uh, that they have these tongues of fire that come down and split and come over each and every one of them, hover over their heads, these visible tongues of fire. And when I think about that, why was such an obvious display needed? What did that show? Uh, and for myself, what I think about is that in the Old Testament, the presence of God was often signaled by fire. Think about the burning bush with Moses, uh, the pillar of fire at night guiding uh, the people out of Egypt, the Shekinah glory of God, uh, fire and light have often been uh, symbolic of the presence of God or the, the burning up of the gifts on the altar. Um, even at Mount Carmel, uh, for the burning up of, of the altar um, from fire from heaven, that the fire has been often uh, a symbol of the presence of God. And so thinking about this symbol, a uh, fire that doesn't actually destroy, <laughs> uh, but that like the burning bush is present and it brings heat and light. Um, I think that this was needed for the disciples in order to see that something was happening as well as experiencing it themselves. And people from the outside could see that something was happening. And I think that this is just part of how, how God knows us so well, that he is a good teacher and teachers use all different senses in order to deliver a message. Uh, when we're being taught, we really need props, especially to help us to see things that we can't normally physically see. And I'm thinking right now about Dave and Audrey, when they teach kids at the Science Museum about the human body, they use props to show kids what's happening on the inside of the body that we normally can't see, uh, and how those things all work together to give them life in every moment. And um, often, without knowing that they are, we've heard how those kids respond by in awe, in wonder, in giving glory to God for that gift uh, of the human body without even really realizing who it is that they're praising and thanking. Um, to be able to see what is normally unseen uh, brings awe and wonder. As, and it's a wonderful teaching to use a, a visible prop 
uh, in order to bring home the point. And I really think that that's what God is doing in this moment with the tongues of fire on the heads of each of these disciples, showing in a tangible way his teaching prop, I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, my presence is with you. Um, because that helps. It helps when we can see uh, what we're being told is true. And uh, in just God's mercy, I think that's what he was doing. And then as we look to the continuation of this in verses 5 through 12, uh, we see not only can they see, but they hear what God is doing. So um, feel free if you have any comments, put them on in there. I'll stop when I see them. Uh, but we'll continue on with Acts 2, chap uh, chapter 2, verses 5 through 12. Now there were a staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of those who are speaking Galileans? <laughs> then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? <laughs> so in this moment, not only do people see that God is present in a new way with the Holy Spirit, but they hear, uh, they hear that the Holy Spirit is present in this miraculous presenting of this gospel message, the message of Jesus, through Galileans <laughs> who are speaking the languages of all of the nations present right there. Uh, for this Jewish festival of the Pentecost, people, converts from all around the world, as they came together, hearing this message spoken in their own language. Um, and it's an amazing thing to hear and to see. Uh, David says, God's word is universal. Absolutely. That when God chose to speak his message of love and saving grace to the world, he didn't just use words. He used actions. He used the, the physical sacrificial love of Jesus and Jesus' death and his resurrection. And that action is equally true in every language. <laughs> Any language that you can interpret and speak of that action, it's that Jesus is the word of God uh, put into action for our sake. Um, so we hear that and we see that in the Holy Spirit sharing that truth in every language. And I think this is such a beautiful thing. I love the Pentecost, uh, the, this miracle that was shown at the Pentecost, that God knows your language, um, that God's promise is for you, for all of your people. And uh, you don't have to learn Hebrew first in order to know that this message is for you, that uh, God has come to meet you right in it, in the midst of all of it. And, um, and I think what's also true about all of this is that uh, it, the beautiful message that we hear from this is often how you, sh how you hear something is how you will share it, right? The way that you receive a message is part of the message. Um, it's part of how you relate it to other people when you receive it. So for, for the Holy Spirit to use these Galileans, uh, these uh, Jewish followers, these uh, devote uh, men of God who had been following with Jesus and learning from Jesus, uh, to be able to speak, to stand up and to speak of Jesus' saving work in every language when people from all of those different nations hear the message of Jesus in their language, it's permission giving that that's also how they can share it. That when they go back to their villages, back to the region of the world that they're from, since they heard of Jesus in their own language, they also can share of Jesus in their own language, which means they can share it in their own cultures, in their own families, in their own people group. Um, so I think it's just a beautiful picture of how much God understands us, that God knows us, 
that even the way that we do things conveys a message to other people. And he wanted that nobody to miss that what Jesus had done was for them. Um, and again, he's using the Hebrew people. He's using his chosen people who are blessed to be a blessing in order to share this message with the nations, so, which is also a beautiful thing uh, to see that, that happen in this moment at the festival of the Pentecost. Um, so we have the message is seen in the tongues of fire. It's heard in the proclaiming of this message of Jesus saving work in all of these different languages. Um, and hello to Kathy and to Dave. Good to see you both. Glad to have you with us today. And then we hit what we always hit. <laughs> it is uh, unavo unavoidable. Uh, every time that the saving message of what God has done for the world is proclaimed uh, about Jesus Christ into the world, the very first thing that we hit in humanity is skepticism, right? Of is God really doing something? Is this miraculous moment really happening? Um, so that's what we see in verse 13 uh, in chapter Acts chapter 2. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. <laughs> Which I think is the reaction probably from people who didn't speak any of these other languages, who only spoke uh, Hebrew or or you know some of the the languages from that region, so they didn't really understand that all of these languages that were being spoken were actually conveying a message to real people. Uh, they didn't understand that that was making sense. Uh, so, not understanding what happened, uh, the human knee jerk reaction is to dismiss it. To uh, explain it away, say that doesn't mean anything, that's not important, it's just they've had too much wine. Uh, and how many times do we do that when God shows us something miraculous, something beyond our understanding? How our first response is to think, ah, I don't know if I can believe that, I don't know if that really means anything. Um, and sometimes I wonder if this was also kind of a fear response, was this bravado that they didn't understand what in the world is going on. And so in a way to kind of try to make sense of the world or try to control it, uh, they needed to laugh it off. They wanted to explain it away into something that didn't make sense. And I think that is a very common human reaction to the unexplained, uh, to the, the supernatural, um, that what we don't understand, we try to belittle. But God's ways are not our ways. <laughs> and the ways that he moves sometimes take us by surprise. And uh, that's very much true at the Pentecost. Um, so we see the skepticism of the crowd in verse 13, by some of them at least, uh, who are taken aback by all of this that's happening. Um, and who say, they've just had too much wine. So hello to the Watnamos. Glad to have you with us as we're in our study. We are in Acts 2. And uh, we, are, we have just finished looking through uh, some of these earlier chapters and through uh, Acts 2, verse 13. Now we're going to take a look at Acts 2, 14 and on, 14 through 21. So we've seen how God, they have seen the Holy Spirit was at work. They have heard that the Holy Spirit at work. And here's a move now uh, where Peter uh, steps up to try to help people understand what's happening, to put into context what this all means. So in, in verse 14, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
So Peter puts into context uh, by, by quoting the prophet Joel uh, that this was part of God's plan all along, that God's plan was to pour out his Holy Spirit on the people, that, um, that every person, young and old, male and female, would be um, filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit and be able to connect with the Spirit's heart and mind and will, uh, and to be able to prophesy, to be able to see and to know uh, the heart of God. It, it's a beautiful, beautiful picture uh, and a phenomenal call uh, of God's heart for the world. Um, God's immediate presence has been God's plan all along, prophesied even by the prophet Joel. And then he continues on, uh, in verse 22, uh, 22 through 24, we're going to take a look at. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. In the midst of all of this, this uh, context of tongues of fire and the speaking of in, in many different languages, this truth of Jesus, Peter steps in, gives the context that this is coming from the heart of the God that you know. Uh, the God who you've known all along. This is part of his plan. And this Jesus is how God has moved his plan forward. Yeah, so he brings us uh, from the prophet Joel in the context, then he introduces Jesus. And as he said, as you yourselves know, uh, it tells us that those gathered in a crowd, they are familiar with Jesus. <laughs> this was only, you know, 50 days ago uh, that, that Jesus died and rose, uh, that that people understood that Jesus had done signs and miracles and had been among them. So he is calling to mind uh, this person of Jesus of Nazareth that God has shown them and who's showing them God's heart. Um, and the concept of God's saving work here, he is presenting, freeing us from the agony of death uh, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on Jesus and that that truth that salvation promise is ours too because of Jesus um, and then he moves in in uh, verses 25 uh, through 36 he continues to give context to this promise and arena had mentioned this a little bit earlier that the the Pentecost was uh, thought to be when David had died. So there is a, a context here that everyone who is celebrating the festival of the Pentecost all together are thinking about David. Uh, they're thinking about uh, his place in the story. And of course, there are lots of prophecies about the line of David from which the Messiah will come. So hello to Dan. Good to have you with us. So Arena, if there's anything more that comes to mind as we're going through this, please feel free to to jump in and share as well. But uh, I'm going to read these verses about David so we can see this context. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, this is Peter now, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Hello to Diane and to Dave. Thanks again. Um, yeah, it's good to be able to take a look at all of these things. So knowing that context, that people are thinking about David and the death of David, uh, for Peter to bring up this point that David's tomb is here, but he was promised that of his line there would be one who did not see decay, uh, that there would be a promise where, um, where the enemies would be placed under the the feet, the footstool, and the enemy is death. Um, that Peter is giving the context of this, the greater context of, of the promise of God for all of his people coming through the line of David, coming through Jesus, and now extending by the Holy Spirit uh, as an invitation out to the world. Um, it, it's such a beautiful thing and a beautiful speech by Peter. And I know for the actual day of Pentecost, that reading is usually so long anyway, and it's so full of rich stuff that we hardly ever get to the whole, <laughs> the whole speech that Peter gives, which is, uh, which is a, a to our detriment, because it really is a beautiful speech, um, and it's full of so much truth. So Peter brings in this tie of, of the past and the future of what God is doing. Oh, Arena says, notice how directly Peter rebukes his listener his listeners, that Jesus, which you crucified, no beating around the bush for them. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> he's, he's very much pointing the finger, you have done this, you know, confess uh, and receive. And that's really the call that he leads them to. And they listen. This is the amazing thing. They actually hear this message that Peter is not holding back. Um, and they hear it and they respond. Uh, they say in verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That with that, he's extending um, that promise, that, that action to repent and to receive, to wait and receive this gift of the Holy Spirit, because then that's what will move them uh, forward. That, and that's true for all of us. We all need the power of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, in order to forgive us, renew us, and lead us into that call that we're given. Um, and that, that does start with, with confession. It starts with um, confessing that we are not enough uh, in ourselves, that we need the power of God in order to draw us into the things of God in this world. Um, and so we see that in a powerful way. And 3,000 are added to their number that day. Uh, and from that festival, of course, many of those 3,000 return home to their, all their different corners of the world, to the languages that they speak, to their own communities. And the Holy Spirit that they have received now will move them into their own mission where he's calling them to be. And uh, as I was talking about on Sunday, I think it's so important uh, that in seasons of, of lots of change like this, that we listen to those, those same words of Jesus that we wait and, we, and wait and pray that we receive from the Holy Spirit, what we're called to do, and let him move us into what's next. Um, and I think listening is so important, and especially with all of the events of this past week, uh, with the, the world uh, erupting with so many changes and so many hurts, uh, so many people uh, from hearts of compassion just want to act. They just want to do something to show that they care. But sometimes that impulse to do something right now <laughs> It can actually be more about us uh, than about the people that we want to bless. Sometimes we can think that we're acting to help and in reality we can end up hurting or creating stumbling blocks we don't actually mean to create. Um, they, you know what they say about assuming. <laughs> assuming is bad. So uh, in order for us to really bless others in a way that actually feels like blessing to them, it first takes time to listen, uh, to listen to them 
to listen to uh, what's on people's hearts, uh, and to listen to God, to wait and receive uh, for how God would have us act and to move, and uh, what would actually feel like blessing uh, to the person that we seek to bless, uh, that that's part of the compassionate reaction as well. So as uh, at the Pentecost, these believers have received the Holy Spirit, and they go home to their different corners of the world. Uh, I, I'd be curious to know how each one of them were moved by the Holy Spirit to act on that gift that they had received. Um, and that we don't know. We don't know what kind of conversations they had in their own languages with the people that they met in their own homes. But we do know that they were sent home to their own corners of the world. And that takes us into the, the last couple of verses of the book of, of chapter Acts chapter 2. Uh, verses 42 through 47, I will read. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So thinking about the whole context of that, uh, oh, Arena says, God is a God of multiple second chances. These same people who 50 years earlier yelled, crucify him on his blood, be on us and our children. These same people are promised salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit. If only they come to him in repentance. He does not require us to do anything or say something or anything else in our own efforts. He only asks us to come back to him in repentance, and he will use us again. Peter, too, knew this very well after betraying the Lord three times. And now, having been enabled to speak the crowds of, to the people, crowds of people in different languages. Thanks, Arena. Yep, those are her words. Yeah, very true. Uh, the blessing of the heart of God is just all over this Pentecost story. His grace, his mercy, his um, deep love uh, for people who are broken and who sin and who need salvation, who need redeeming. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful testimony to the heart of God that we see in these verses. 50 days, yes. <laughs> yeah, I did catch that too. So looking at this context, after these disciples are sent away, we see how they gather to live into this truth of what the Holy Spirit has shown them into what the Holy Spirit is sending them to. Um, what I noticed in looking at this uh, is definitely the role of community, of, of the one another's of their Christian community, that they met at the temple courts, so they did kind of come together in larger groups. And um, I, I'm not entirely sure with the courts, but I believe that's kind of open air gatherings there. So. Uh, in this time of pandemic, we're trying to do some open air gatherings too <laughs> as we come together. Um, but largely the way that they met and and grew was in devotion and prayer in smaller groups in these house gatherings. Uh, and that we're going to be trying to launch a lot of those in this next season, knowing people aren't very comfortable with larger gatherings of people right now. <clears throat> We'd love to encourage uh, grace gatherings, we're calling them for people to watch the services, to discuss the word together uh, in person or online in, in ways that you can see the faces and connect with one another um, while we can't do the things that we have normally done. Uh, and so it's, it's a wonderful testimony to what the Holy Spirit can do and will do in these groups to take a look at these verses from Acts. And we're praying that God will continue to move in a new way uh, in these days that we live out together. So the questions I have just to ponder <clears throat> is what is the Holy Spirit saying to you right now? And how do we live as the church in the world, in as the church out of the building, largely in this season, in ways that are powerful, uh, both for the Holy Spirit's work in us and for us to be a light to the world? So with that, I'd like to end with a, a time of prayer again. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, thanks, regrets, intercession, and purpose. To think about the things that you're thankful for, to spend a time of confession, to intercede for others, and then ask the Lord to show the purpose of this season for you. So please join me in prayer. 
Holy Spirit, we thank you for your work in our lives. Um, we thank you for Jesus, for the gift of your death and resurrection for us, that your grace, completely undeserved on our part, um, of your self-sacrificial redeeming love. Lord, we rely on you. And Holy Spirit, we rely on you to teach us and to remind us of the heart of Jesus um, as we move forward in the things that await us in the world. So Lord, we thank you that you are present here with us, no matter how the world changes, uh, that you are here with us. And so Lord, we, we pray that um, in this time also that Holy Spirit, you would convict our hearts as you convicted the crowds at the Pentecost, uh, convict us for those things that we need to confess. Um, we confess, Lord, that we are not enough, um, that we do not have the wisdom, we do not have the righteousness, we do not have the goodness on our own. Uh, but Lord, you do, and you work in us and through us. And so, Lord, we pray that, uh, that as we confess our need to you, as we confess our sin to you, that you would, by the, the saving work of Jesus, that you would make us new creations, that you would help us uh, to hear what it is that you want to say to us, that we would receive your power, Lord, to move in ways that you call us to move. Lord, we pray for in, in intercession for those in our world right now, for all of those who are hurting uh, from all of the things that have happened in the past week, Lord, for hearts that are hurting, for lives that are hurting, for businesses that are hurting, for um, leaders that are hurting. Lord, we pray that you would um, bring your healing. And we know, Lord, when the world seems like an open wound, that that actually is a sign of hope because it's only when the wound is brought into the open that it can be healed. And so, Lord, we, we trust and we believe that you are bringing your healing power. And we ask, Lord, that you would do it through us. Um, Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds um, to be blessed to be a blessing. Lord, help us to know, to listen, uh, to how to act in ways that actually will feel like a blessing to those people that we want to bless. And Lord, we pray that you would give us uh, humble hearts uh, to be malleable, to be formed, to learn, um, to confess what we don't know and in order to learn what we do, uh, in order to reflect your heart more accurately, more fully uh, through our words and deeds in this world. And Lord, we also pray for the gift of your purpose. And we pray that you would make clear for each and every one of us, what is the, the part that you are calling us to play right now in this season of our lives and this season of the world? Uh, Lord, what is the part that you are calling each and every one of us to play in the bigger picture of the body of Christ at work in the world? Um, Lord, we pray that you would show us by your Holy Spirit what that role is and that you would empower us by your Holy Spirit to move with you into it boldly and with your love. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hi, Steve. Nice to have you with us. <laughs> Hope you have a wonderful week. And Tyler, too. Hello to Tyler. Uh, so blessings on your week, and we'll hope that we'll see you again at 4 o'clock next Wednesday. So God's blessings. Goodbye.